Hi everyone, my name is Maria and welcome to my channel. I'm a marine biologist and today I'm about to watch the movie Meg for the first time. This movie was directed by John Turtletop and it stars Jason Statham. One of my followers asked me whether I had seen this movie or not and I hadn't. And then he sent me the trailer and I was like, Jason Statham, unrealistic underwater marine station, prehistoric shark, I'm in. Today I am going to put my marine biology scientific glasses and I'm gonna watch the movie through them. I am going to be analyzing the scientific accuracy of the movie and explaining some stuff. <laughs> scientific accuracy of Meg. Yeah, I'm doing that. To be clear, I am aware this is not supposed to be a scientifically accurate movie, but that's what I do. My expectations going into this is that it's gonna be highly scientifically inaccurate, but it's gonna be hella entertaining. I'm expecting it to be somewhere between Sharknado and uh, Jaws. It's gonna be self-aware of its like ridiculousness, but it's not gonna be as ridiculous as Sharknado. But it's also not gonna be as serious as Jaws. Obviously, spoiler alert, I'm gonna be showing some footage from the movie, so if you haven't watched it and you want to watch it, go do that and come here again to watch this review with me. You have been warned. Okay, let's start. I'm actually quite excited. He's watching it with me. There are no underwater marine stations like that, unfortunately, and I thought they did exist until until that was pretty old, actually. I thought there were a lot of underwater marine stations. Having a building like this made out of glass is probably not a very good idea. First of all, if it's very deep, how much, how thick would that glass need to be? And if it's very thick, you wouldn't even be able to see anything that's happening outside, which defies the purpose of it being glass anyway, so glass underwater under pressure big building with people bad idea i think there's like one underwater marine station where people can actually be inside and work for more than a couple of hours there's one in uh, florida keys that's nothing compared to something of this size and that's the only underwater marine station active that I'm underwater that I know of my dream as a child was to work in a, a, a station like this We've all believed the Mariana Trench was the deepest Science. place on Earth. I've been a theory that what we think is the bottom might actually be a layer of hydrogen sulfide beneath that cloud and the freezing cold thermal climate. There could be a completely new world. The origin is about to see if my father's right. If there's warm water below. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Yes, the Marina, the Mariana Trench is the deepest part of the ocean. Actually, the deepest point of the Mariana Trench is called Challenger Deep, and it's at around 11 kilometers deep. There is some discussion on the exact depth, but there have been cameras sent down there. Now, hydrogen sulfide and layers of hydrogen sulfide are things that can actually exist. Hydrogen sulfide is a compound uh, produced usually by bacteria in the absence of oxygen. Volcanic activity and geological activity can also produce hydrogen sulfide. We humans also produce it in tiny, tiny amounts because it is actually toxic. In the Black Sea, apparently, there is a layer of hydrogen sulfide that is sometimes created near the sediments. This is something that can actually exist in the water uh, and in the sea. As they say, it's a layer of hydrogen sulfide that separates the cold water from the warm water below and they call it thermocline. That's wrong. A thermocline is a layer of water that separates other two, but it's usually characterized by having a different temperature. So it's a layer that has a different temperature from the one above and the one below. And if you say thermocline means you are characterizing this due to its temperature. If what characterizes the separation here is the presence of hydrogen sulfide, then it's a chemocline because it's based on its chemical characteristics. I would need some further explanation as to how there's such a layer under, uh, under this cold layer that is warm. The, the further away you get from the surface, the further you are from the sun and from the heat coming from the sun, the colder it gets. So the deep ocean is pretty cold. But otherwise, I mean, so far so good. But highly unlikely that this would actually be the case in the Mariana Trench because people have been down there. There's been photographs and footage of the bottom. So there's machines that have been there. Very unlikely that they would have missed that there's actually more water underneath. But okay, let's see. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see what's up. The lights.
I think the deepest fish had, was found at like eight kilometers deep or something. I saw this fish here, this yeah, white fish that appeared on screen now, snailfish. He was the deepest one found. Also, angler fishes do not go so deep or have never been caught so deep. Surprising it's there. Oh, that's a lot of life. Oh wow, oh, those are hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents are areas of high volcanic activity and they exist where two tectonic plates meet and there's material from closer from the interior of the earth coming up to the surface, creating this kind of smoke that brings a lot of minerals and nutrients that would otherwise not be there. Because of this input of nutrients from inside of the earth to the surface, it, at the deep, there are these kind of biodiversity hotspots around hydrothermal vents. For instance, at the surface of the ocean, life is mostly fueled by light. Organisms like algae and phytoplankton can do photosynthesis through light, which means they can kind of create organic material or food that can then be transferred throughout the food webs. In the deep, there is no light. And that's one of the reasons for why life there is much more scarce than at the surface of the ocean. However, in these hydrothermal vents, there are some new nutrients coming from the interior, uh, interior of the earth that certain microorganisms can utilize in kind of the same way as the ones at the surface use light to also produce food. So to produce organic material that can then be also transferred throughout the food webs. So then you can also have fish and other macro animals, bigger animals uh, occurring around these hydrothermal vents. What you see here, it's actually kind of representative of the truth. I mean, that, those are some big hydrothermal vents and that's a lot of life around them. But there are hot spots called hydrothermal vents and they kind of look like that. So that's not too bad. Good, Meg, good. It's big. It's How big. It's huge. And it's moving fast. Is it your prehistoric friend? DJ. Best handshake ever. No, why See, is it a bad idea? Works every time. Guys, that's a bad idea. No. Yeah, no. What? We gotta can the lights. My smart light. <laughs> In the depths of the ocean, there's no light. The only light that exists there is either maybe if there's some like volcanic activity from the floor or if the animals produce it themselves. Something called bioluminescence, which is actually very common in the deep. The result of that is that whenever there is light, it's going to attract predators, especially big ones, provided that they did exist, like, megalodon, like megalodons, because there's not much food in the deep, usually, and they will try to catch anything they can. And if they see light, and there is especially from such a big thing, they will try to eat it. It's a tough situation they're in, because they need to start all the, the stuff to be able to go back, but on the other hand, if they start everything, the Meg is gonna see him and gonna try to eat them. That looks like a Star Wars ship. That looks awesome! Oh, that's not a megalodon. That's a giant... What's happening? It's a huge squid. Giant it's got the glider. There are giant squids. The longest squid is uh, the colossal squid. It's like 20, 25 meters. It's a megalodon. Impossible. <laughs> How does he know that? It's a megalodon. He didn't even see it. Oh, Jason. 20 to 25 me meters megalodon is pretty big. I did some researching before this because if there's one thing I knew about this movie, it's that there was gonna be a megalodon in it. The estimate maximum length of a megalodon was around 18 meters. So 20 to 25 is extremely large. But of course, we don't exactly know. There is no complete skeleton of a megalodon because the megalodon was a shark and sharks have cartilaginous skeletons. And the cartilage is, for instance, what we have here in the ears. And they decompose and, and they don't survive for very long. So there are no ske megalodon skeleton fossils. Most of the things we know about them is based on their teeth because teeth are conserved and there have we did find uh, megalodon teeth fossils and based on what we know that they were around 18 meters 
So that's a pretty big one. I find it uh, funny is that he was immediately like, it's a megalodon. There are like so many different shark species. There were so many prehistoric shark species. There are so many different, maybe there was like a completely different species that had just like survived in the deep because the megalodon is thought to be extinct for about 2.6 million years. For that amount of time, there could have been other species of sharks developing instead of a megalodon. Jason is pretty smart. That's what I'm concluding here. That's a big shark. Hey, look. So it seems like the megalodon escaped his um, deep thing. A couple of things here. First of all, if he could leave it, why hasn't, hasn't he done that before? Second of all, if he did exist in this other completely different environment from the water which is above it, they would probably be adapted to that type of environment, which apparently is completely different from the water above the thermocline. And actually the Megalodon is thought to have lived in warmer waters, so it's really unlikely he would live in the deep. But if an animal is adapted, has adapted millions of years to live in, under, in a certain environment at a certain temperature, a certain pressure, it's very unlikely that it would survive suddenly changing to a completely different conditions. Let me just pause here to say that it would be very surprising and extremely unlikely that a shark that big, or any big fish for that matter, could even live at such depths. The reasons are not only cold temperatures and scarcity of food, but also pressure. Pressure in the Challenger Deep is more than 1000 times higher than the atmospheric pressure that we experience here at the surface. Even the so-called deep diving sharks do not usually dive below 2000 meters, and the Challenger Deep is more than five times deeper than that. This is also one of the reasons why it is almost impossible for a shark like the Meg to have survived down there all these years. When the glider came up, the thermocline was intact, so it was one degree Celsius, right? Yeah. But a minute later, when the evolution came up, the temperature increased by 25 degrees. A shark would come right through there. 20 sharks, for that matter. When the Meg at the origin it slammed into a thermal vent. Those can release millions of gallons per minute. The heat from that vent cleared the path through the freezing cold wave. There's way too much for me to process. My question of how the hell the shark came out of that water into this wa above water has been answered. Now, I, I, I'm not a fluid physics person. I don't know if what they just said is accurate and if something like this could happen. But what they're saying is basically that when the rover came back up, made a corridor of 25 degrees water from 11 kilometers deep until the surface, or at least until when it's starting to get warmer, which is very high. It's like, it's very cold until relatively not deep anymore. So this would mean they would have to have created, brought up like 25 degree waters, made like a corridor that the shark just happened to go exactly <laughs> This doesn't sound like a uh, very accurate to me. Sharks have no fins. They were killed by shark poachers. They cut off the fins and throw the shark back to die. This happens a oh, lot. Or full of soup. Unfortunately, yeah. even the score. This happens, yeah. In Southeast Asia, <laughs> they so. use the shark fins for soup, and so they fish the okay. sharks just to shark cut fish. off their fins, and they throw the rest of the body back into the water. Let me do what I do best. Uh... Hey, hey. That's not very marine biology of them. Okay, I don't know what she is or what kind of marine biologist she is, like I don't know what she's studying, if she's studying sharks. If you are a shark biologist and if you st study sharks, you wouldn't want to kill it to study it. If people who study sharks do not do that. On the other hand, you could also argue that the megalodon, now that it's been introduced, it's kind of an invasive species and you could argue that maybe it's not a good idea to just leave him like 
around to kill all of the other animals that have been living in this ecosystem. That's arguable. That's an argument. But you wouldn't be happy about killing a shark if you're a marine biologist and if you work with sharks especially. If I would find out there's a prehistoric creature out there, an, a shark, um, as scary as it might be, it's it's a force of nature. It's a incredible animal. I wouldn't be just like, yay, we killed the like the only probably prehistoric shark to still have survived these last million years. No. And not for science. We did what people always do. Discover and then destroy. Oh. Thank you, ma'am. What's going on down there? Try to stay out of its mouth. These people have a very cool head. They're always so chill, still capable, like in the most stressful of situations, like giving the best, saying the best one-liners ever. The end. All right, that was Megalodon for you by John Turtletau. That was kind of entertaining. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It is kind of what I was expecting. A lot of really well delivered one-liners. Jason Statham being Jason Statham. Marine biologist, which is always cool to see as one of the protagonists. A lot of action. There was no shark punching, but almost. Entertainment, pretty high level. A scientific accuracy. I mean, they got some things right, and they got some, they talked about some things that do exist, and they show some things that do exist in real life and in nature, but like, they mixed a lot of things together that do not make sense. But overall, you know, it's not supposed to be a scientifically accurate movie. Okay, before ending this video, I want to answer the ultimate question. Is it possible that there are still megalodons today? Extremely, extremely unlikely. First of all, as we have just seen, it would be a very big shark and big animals leave traces. For instance, the giant squid. It was only photographed for the first time in 2002. This was only 18 years ago. However, we knew it existed because a lot of body parts and sometimes almost entire bodies had come to the surface and a lot of remains washed ashore. We would also see bite marks in other animals, we would have seen carcasses of other animals maybe with bites with the size of the mouth this animal would have. We would find signs of struggle with other with their prey and things like that, which we have never found. Besides that, we have not found any modern day megalodon teeth. Shark lose a lot of teeth during their lifetime. Sharks lose and regrow their gnasher's teeth every two weeks. If megalodons did exist after those 2.6 million years, that we would have found some teeth since then until today, which we haven't. So it's very unlikely that they still exist. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you had some fun with me. I hope you maybe learned a little bit. And that's it. If you want to watch more marine related content, uh, don't forget to subscribe. If you like the video, don't forget to press the like button. And if you, yeah, that's it. Share this video if you want to share it with someone who maybe would enjoy it. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.